Hi and welcome and I'm so thrilled that today I get to speak to one of my old mates, Dr. David Hamilton. It's so lovely to uh, have you with us on the show, David, former scientist and author of, oh my goodness, is it 10 books now? Welcome. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Wow. It's yeah. lovely to talk to you, David. Now, for anyone who, who hasn't come across your, your work, you're, you're kind of known really as the king of kindness. And you've writ written uh, you know, a few books around kindness and why kindness is good for you. And uh, we'll get into that in a, in, in a little while. But, but just for, to give people a little bit of background who maybe haven't come across you before, tell us about your, your really sort of fascinating work that you used to do, which kind of led on to what you do now. And, and I, I've heard the story before, but I've Delighted to hear it again, and I'm sure anybody else feels the same way. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, of course. Yeah, well, first of all, thanks for having me on here. It's really great to to hang out and have a, a wee chat yeah. again. Uh, so, uh, well, to, to be honest, I I, I think most people uh, maybe listening haven't heard really my backstory. So yeah, so I started out working in the pharmaceutical industry. I did a PhD in science called organic chemistry, which is nothing to do with organic food. <laughs> unfortunately uh, it's it's more like a uh, adult lego but instead of taking lego bricks of different shapes and sizes to build you know buildings and and things so organic chemists take atoms of different shapes and sizes and we build molecules and that becomes so people that we usually get hired with pharmaceutical by pharmaceutical companies and the lego constructions you're making are drugs but but what really fascinated me during that time was uh, how people were improving on placebos. So yeah. I started in my spare time uh, to research the placebo effect uh, and collect not only statistics, but an understanding of not only how, but why it actually works. So how is it and why does it happen? Why is it that you, you think something or feel something or believe something and that would actually have a healing effect? Because I remember my colleagues would always dismiss it as, as just the placebo effect. And that was a habit that you learn when you go into the pharmaceutical industry to dismiss it as it's just the placebo effect without really any thought of what it actually is. So I decided to look into it and understand why it happened. And because it was so interesting, I decided that I became passionate about understanding how your mind and emotions and could, could affect your body and, and want to help people. So I decided to resign from the industry after about four years, really. It's, it's fascinating, David. And I know I've heard you speak about how you then looked at um, or into, really into depth with this placebo effect. And tell us a story about how you discovered that, um, I can't remember exactly what it was, but something to do with people learning to play the piano, even, even managed to not, well, you, you tell the story, it'd be much better than me trying. <laughs> yeah, a fascinating example. See, see I, I'd become fascinated with the, the effects of visualization. You know, a lot of people visualize whether it's to improve their health or even to improve their life situation. And it's always been a real interest and a passion of mine, visualization. Uh, and I came across some research that was done at Harvard, Harvard University, very famous neuroscient uh, neurologist called Alvaro Pascal Leon. And he had a group of volunteers who would sit in front of a piano and play a series of five notes on each of the five fingers. So they basically go plunk, 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 up and down a scale for two hours and five days, five consecutive days. Now it's not two hours straight because that's tiring, but you do like a minute of playing the notes, two minutes of resting, a minute of playing the notes, something like that. But, yeah. but you're playing the notes for a couple of hours. And they had, they had their brain scanned every day and, and it turned out that the region of the brain connected to the finger muscles had grown like a muscle. In fact, if you measured it by about a factor of about 30 to 40 times. But the other part of the study was, while the group of volunteers were playing the notes physically on a piano, another group of volunteers had their hands flat on the table and they were to play the notes in their mind. So they were just to imagine they were plunking notes. So imagine the physical sensations, imagine feeling as if they really were playing the notes, but not playing the notes. Now they, all, they did it for again, two hours on, on the five consecutive days. They had their brain scans too, brain scanned as well. And the brain scans were exactly the same. In other wow. words, the regions of their brain connected to their finger muscles had also changed in size by 30 to 40 times. And if you looked at both set of brain scans, those who played the notes versus those who imagined playing the notes side by side, you cannot tell the difference. You cannot tell who was in, who played the notes or who imagined. In other words, in many ways, the brain doesn't make a distinction between whether you're doing something 
or whether you're imagining doing the something. Yeah. So the brain and the imaginary are much the same thing. It's incredible, isn't it? And, it and, and it's incredible when you think that it's only actually in recent years that we've understood neuroplasticity. You know, at one time we'd think, right, that's it. That's the way you are. And it's only recently we realise yeah. the, the power of the mind, really. Um, w w for people who, um, you know, but obviously I, I, I'm talking to a lot of people who uh, want to give up the booze or maybe they already have given up the booze. And they get this almost voice in their head saying, oh, you know, I'll have, I need another glass of wine, even though they've already had three or whatever it is. And, and many people get to the stage where they recognize, actually, this is about mindset and it's about changing the mindset. How would you suggest people like that start? How, how do you even get started if you're brand new to all this in just recognizing all this power that's actually within you? Well, I mean, first of all, I, I think the, the, the notion itself, just knowing itself that the brain changes in response to your behaviors and actions gives people hope. Mm. And it also gives people like an end point. The, the difficulty some people have, I feel, with changing aspects of life is they don't have an end point. They don't know when the end point will be. And so eventually they get to this point that it's never going to happen. But when you understand a bit about neuroplasticity, you recognize that it only takes a relatively short period of time to build up enough wire, new wiring in the brain so that the new wiring or the new circuitry of the brain is more dominant and stronger than the old stuff because the less uh, attention we give and the less we uh, indulge in our previous patterns of behavior, then those brain circuits begin to shrink. You're really just like if you stop exercising a muscle, the muscle will actually atrophy, it will shrink. Now that just mirrors the process in the brain of, of neuroplasticity kind of in reverse, so to speak. It's exactly the same process. So when people kind of understand that it only takes a, a finite period of time then it actually gives people hope and then a little bit of belief and a little bit more passion and determination because they can see an end point. They know that in a certain period of time, which might be just three weeks or it might be a couple of months, it depends on the person, the effort, but people begin to realize if I can just keep it up for that long, then the brand new circuitry of the brain will be stronger than the old stuff and therefore I, I won't really have to make an effort. It will feel quite easy then because the wiring of the brain has changed substantially. So that's the way I often teach about uh, changes in behavior that you just have, to, here's light at the end of the tunnel, you just need to give it a certain amount of time and you'll yeah. find that the effort required will be significantly less. Yeah, and how do we deal with this inner talk then, which of course we all have, don't we? We've all got that little voice telling us to, oh, go on, you know, you have that 15th Jaffa cake or whatever it is, you know, go on. Uh, or, you know, you're, you're not good enough, you know, we, we'll talk more about that, that little voice later. But we've all got the voice, we've all got yeah, the, yeah. the inner critic, the inner voice. So is it about, do you think, really noticing that? And then actually asking, well, is that true? You know, in other words, separate, separating yourself a little bit from that yeah. constantly nagging voice in your head. Yeah, absolutely. In fact, you, you nailed it in terms of how I, I look at things. Step number one is notice it, be aware of it. Unless we're aware of a behavior, it's difficult to change it. So for me, the moment I notice something, it, I, I start to question it. I mean, there's a couple of different ways I do things. It depends on the context, depends on the situation. But sometimes what I have is a little, a little phrase, a little one-liner that, that reminds me that I can do this or something along those lines. And so whenever I, can, I become aware of myself behaving in a certain way, I'll stop and take a breath. And, and what the taking the breath does is it moves resources to the front of the brain. So you stop running on default. So you immediately bring the resources to that. So I take a sharp intake of breath sometimes, like, and I say my little phrase, right? And now most of the time that's enough. But other times when I find that it just goes back, you know, and that's normal for some people as it just knots back, then I start to inquire. I might take a piece of paper and write inquire, why do I feel this way? Why do I behave in the way? Sometimes I just inquire about why I believe certain things. And it usually takes me back to thoughts or assumptions that I've made in the past without realizing. And so I guess it's diving into your own beliefs. Uh, and usually I'll recognize a, a thought, a belief or an assumption that I've picked up unconsciously maybe, or just assumed 
And, and I'll look, I'll say, oh my good, I can't believe I really thought that. That was when I was like 10 year old or 15 or a child, when I didn't really understand the world the way I understand it now. So of course that's not true. Yeah. And it's almost like your awareness of it shines a little light on it. And then I find if I just keep attention on that over the next couple of days, or on reminding myself that that's actually not true, this is true instead, then it becomes much easier to change a pattern because I've almost gone deeper into something that was controlling it. And yeah. when I do that, then, the behavior, then that little voice doesn't even come back as much. And this is very much linked, of course, to, to all the, the, you know, the other books that you've written. Uh, I love the book, I Heart Me, where you talk about self-love and, you know, the importance of that. And it's very linked to that, of course, because, you know, the stuff you're saying, most of us wouldn't say it to other people. I, I think it was Cheryl Richardson, who I, I once heard her at a Hay House conference that we were both uh, speaking at. And, and she said, you know, if you were standing in, in, uh, in the bathroom and you're looking in the mirror and you're, you're you were saying out loud the thoughts you are thinking. You know, if there was a child in the room, you'd probably be had for abuse because we yeah. say stuff to ourselves, whether out loud or in our head, that we yeah. wouldn't say to anybody else. You know, we're yeah. very unkind, aren't we, to ourselves, yeah. which, which wraps up, you know, beautifully into all the, the stuff that you've researched around both self-love and kindness. How, how do you think, I mean, what, where's the starting point there? For somebody who is maybe locked into a pattern of, uh, of addiction or behavior they really want to change or just is not, is not necessarily in a very good place, um, but they've got enough glimmer of hope to know there's a way out. So yeah. how do they start to, to remind themselves that uh, you know they're worth they're worth loving. Yeah, I, I think again it comes back to, to step number one again. It is awareness, uh, and, and it, it sometimes it's about recognizing that so many of our patterns and so many of our difficulties and challenges in life, if you track back far enough, if you dig into your own thinking processes deep enough, we very often arrive at a, a place where we feel we lack an inner, a genuine inner sense of worthiness and value. And that, that's how I define self-love, uh, an inner sense of worthiness and value. Not necessarily, you know, self-esteem. People get confused sometimes with self-esteem because there's two types of self-esteem. There's the outer stuff where we build our sense of worthiness and value on uh, successes and achievements in life and people having a positive opinion that's external self-esteem whereas internal self-esteem is more like self-love it's an inner sense of worthiness and value yeah. and, and recognizing that so many of the difficulties and challenges can stem from that lack of an inner sense of worthiness and value so recognizing that immediately gives us a goal it gives us somewhere to go for we're not fighting around in the dark looking for solutions we say well that's th that is the answer and so there's a number of ways you can approach that. But one of the simplest things I found, because I struggled with this, the reason why I wrote the book, I Heart to Me, was for me. Mm. Because I had maybe quite a decent, an average amount of the external self-esteem, but none of the internal at all. Yeah, and, I mean, you would certainly wouldn't look at you and think you're someone who hasn't got your, <laughs> your self-love yeah. sorted out, would we? <laughs> yeah, but it, it was all external. And you see so many people in the world where all they have is the external, but then all you really need is a couple of things to go wrong and it's shattering. Yeah. The, the inner self-esteem, the inner sense of worthiness and value, the self-love, that gives you like a buffer. It gives you a feeling of resilience that buffers uh, some of the difficult challenges. So uh, recognizing that that is an answer, uh, that is an you know, a way to approach it is illuminating in some respects. It's like, I know how, I, I know what to do. Then the challenge is, is, is doing that. And there's a number of ways you can approach it. You know, Louise Hay recommends mirror work, telling yourself several times a day, I love you, I love you, I really, really do, looking at yourself in the mirror. That's a great therapy. Uh, things like the, the Tibetan Buddhist loving kindness meditation. May I be filled with loving kindness and be well, peaceful and at ease, happy and free of suffering. That's a really good approach. Uh, also looking at the way that parents behaved and, and asking yourself, I've got a little exercise in the book, uh, how much am I like my parents? And, and you, you look at uh, ways that your parents behaved and the th sort of things you say, they said, and then you look at your own behavior and language and you notice how much is similar and you realize that you literally learned a lot of your own patterns from your parents. So we can drop those uh, just by, again, shining a light on them. But one of the most powerful techniques I've ever found is a neuroscience approach, and it's learning to adjust your posture. Because mm -hmm. how we feel about ourselves uh, is written all over our face and on your body. So what happens is we tend to wear our body 
shoulders and, and tummy, midriff area especially, uh, and facial expressions we wear, how we feel about ourselves yeah. uh, in a variety of situations. So if we can train ourselves to like stand up straight, lengthen your spine, drop your shoulders and relax and train yourself by practicing every day. The, the Harvard Power Pose uh, first uh, popularized uh, by Amy Cuddy at Harvard, where you stand like Wonder Woman for two minutes a day. That's really powerful. But you must add to that uh, relentless corrections during the day. Like correct yourself as you're walking, correct yourself as you're standing, as you come into company, you know, whatever you're doing, and make an adjustment to your posture. And what happens, if you remember the piano study, if you move a muscle repetitively, it, it wires the circuits of the brain. Mm. So now the circuits of the brain you're wiring are those associated with feeling better about yourself. Confident, it, yeah, and strong. Yeah, yeah. You're adjusting yeah. strong, confident, self-esteem, self-love posture. Mm. So that's the brain circuits you're wiring. And because you're no longer indulging in the old or indulging less in the old posture, then you're, you're shrinking the wiring for that. And again, you get to this tipping point after a period of time where the dominant circuitry of the brain, the dominant wiring of the brain is the, the wiring associated with, I have an inner sense of worthiness and value. And then you find that you don't have to make these postural corrections because it's now a habit. And it's yeah. such a powerful exercise uh, that's relatively easy to do because you're not really having to investigate the contents of your mind. So there's different ways of approaching the same subject and it depends on the individual really. Yeah. But that's yeah. my favorite. Yeah, I love that. I absolutely love that. Um on on to the, the books that you've written about kindness. Um why I loved why kindness is good for you. It, it that book totally rocked my world. <laughs> just um just to explain to to anyone who ha who hasn't read it or isn't aware of the concept, um, why kindness is good for us. It, well, it's good for us in a number of ways. First of all, it makes us feel feel happier. It has massive impacts on mental health, for especially as the giver of kindness. But it has a phenomenal effect in the cardiovascular system. And this is, I investigated this quite a lot because my main fields when I worked in the pharmaceutical industry were cardiovascular and cancer, but predominantly cardiovascular. Uh, and, and it's amazing that when you be kind to someone, because of how it makes you feel, it almost like the exact opposite from feeling stressed. You know, you feel stress. The feelings of stress are what give rise to the, the physiology of stress in the body. It's yeah. not the circumstance because two people can have the same set of circumstances. One could feel stressed, one could feel relaxed. So the circumstance itself has got nothing to do with the physiology. Yeah. The physiology of stress is a product of how that situation makes you feel. So feelings generate physiology. But when you be kind, because that makes you feel nice or warm or connected, psychologists now call it elevation, you're elevated, that produces a whole different kind of physiology from stress. In fact, in some ways, it is the exact opposite from stress. And, and that has tremendous benefits to the cardiovascular system. It lowers blood pressure, for example. It helps to clean arteries, thin blood, so to speak. Uh, and it also has impacts on some of the ways that the body ages internally. You know, almost like stress can impact some of the processes that age the body internally. So it makes sense, therefore, that the, the physiology of kindness would have the opposite effect. And it does indeed have the opposite effect. So I went into a lot of that for adults, children, all these different things in the book and mm. the newer versions. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's amazing, isn't it? Because, you know, initially you, one would think that only the recipient would, would feel good about the act of kindness that's been given to them. But in fact, you know, as we know, it's, it's, it's both ways, um, yeah. um, which has led on, of course, to uh, a lot of people talking about random acts of kindness. Um, yeah. You know, well, it, again, if, if this is new for somebody, where would they start if somebody's thinking, actually, I'd quite like some of that? <laughs> what, what are some little things that we can do? I know you've, you've brought out the little book of kindness um, i'm really looking forward to seeing it. i haven't seen the book yet but tell us a bit about that book and and about some of the oh lovely well anyone who's watching the video can see it oh cool okay um so you've got presumably you've got lots of suggestions in there as to yeah, yeah. Um, as to how we can uh practice acts of kindness which i'm guessing you know you're going to tell me don't need to cost a lot of money um oh. or necessarily even take an awful lot of time no, I mean, it's context. It depends on a person's context. We, we, you know, we all have a different 
context, a different situation, different opportunities in life. So what I do, I recommend towards the end of the book is a seven day kindness challenge. And if you're really up for it, it can be a 21 day. And if you're really, really up to it, you can go the whole year, make it three, six, five. Uh, but the challenge is to do an act of kindness every day for seven days. And you've got to vary the act. So you can't do the same thing every day. I mean, you can if you like, but it only counts on the first day. You've got to do something different each day. Uh, I also, during that week, you've got to do at least one act of kindness that stretches you a little bit, pushes you out of your comfort zone a little bit. It might mean you have to connect with someone if that's a challenge for you. Uh, and another one has to be completely anonymous. In other words, no one must know that such a thing was you. Mm -hmm. or, or what you actually did. Now, the reason, you know, one of the reasons for the seven day act of kindness is because we all have a different context in our life and different situations in our life, suggesting a universal type of act of kindness isn't applicable to everyone. So, what the seven day does is it helps you find within the context of your own life what are the sorts of things that I can do based on my life situation, where I go during the day, my resources, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm not so much in the book, in like the precursor, the other version, the longer version of the book, The Five Side Effects of Kindness, I, and why kindness is good for you, I specifically gave people a list. But in the little book, I'm saying, you've got to create your own list, because our all life contexts are different. Yeah. So regardless of where you are, you've got to find something that you can do every day. And that then you start to learn for yourself, and that's really powerful because you learn for yourself how to actually be kind without someone telling you this is what you need to do. Mm. Kind of comes a training program, right? I mean, in terms of random acts of kindness, you know, the ones that are anonymous. I mean, I've seen uh, you know cafes now. Quite a few cafes will actually put a sign outside, and they'll say, you know, do you want to? pay it forward you know so you pay for a coffee for the next person and or you pay for an ice cream or whatever um i mean i think those kind of things are are you know really really cool um but but is there anything i mean can, i mean just give us one tip maybe just one little one idea that doesn't cost anything uh because you know i, I think I, I think the idea of it needing to be associated with money can confuse it for some people so can, can just give us okay. one freebie so if you know of someone in your life, whether a family member, a friend, or a work colleague who's having a hard time, ask them how they're feeling. Let them know uh, that you're interested in how they're feeling and, and just, just listen to them. Mm. You know, that doesn't cost anything, but it could be a phone call or it could be literally turning up at someone's door or at their desk at work or something and saying, like, how are you doing? Or if you know the person's having a good time, just offer your, just by your presence, people recognize, people, they, they get to know that you're here for them. You know, and that time, that seems like a tiny little thing for you, but it's a huge thing for them. Because I've been, I've been that person who's needed help at times. And my goodness, when someone says, I'm here for you, or just turns up, how are you doing? It, it's literally, it's, it's a wonderful feeling. But for them, it was probably a tiny little thing. But for yeah. me, as the sufferer at the time, it was massive. It was huge. Yeah. You know, I struggled with depression several years ago. And so when that happened for me, it, it, it opened the doors to a change uh, that wouldn't have happened. It was my mum who, who did it there. Mm. Uh, it it's very interesting as well, isn't it? You know, when people, I think when people are suffering from depression or anxiety or when there's just something really difficult going on in their life, um, I think you're absolutely right. For someone to offer them a, an act of kindness, however small, is amazing. But actually, that's almost the time when they need to do the little acts of kindness because, you know, as well. get out of yourself kind of thing. It's one of the best things you can ever do, isn't it? To actually stretch yourself a little bit while I you're know. feeling, you know, anxious yourself. I always used to say this to my mum when she was, uh, you know, ha having some mental health issues. I used to just say, is there anybody else, you know, who lives near you that you could do something nice for? And she, I remember once she said, well, I could get a, a newspaper for, you know, a, a friend who couldn't, who couldn't get out. I said, That's an amazing thing. How amazing will that be? Something yeah. so tiny. Um, so I, th I, th I think you're, you're really right. I, l I absolutely love um, your, you know, your, your take on it all. Um, how do you think these things link together in terms of our self-care? Um, you know, a lot of people are going through 
you know, just a really rough time. And we hear this buzzword self-care and, and you know, we're not talking about booking yourself into a spa. Um, you know, these can be tiny things. How do you think all these things tie up? It, sometimes it, self-care can even be saying no, for yeah. example. Now, self-care is another version. It's one way to be kind to ourselves because I think in the, the dedicating ourselves sometimes to helping other people, it's quite easy to forget yourself. And some people actually end up uh, spreading themselves so thin that they end up, it becomes stressful for them. And that there is, is even scientific research showing that the benefits of kindness get to a point until you start stretching yourself too thin. And then they start having a negative effect because you're beginning to run out of time and feel stressed and yeah. you know, a whole host of other things. So self-care becomes something, a, a version of being kind to yourself that you absolutely must do. I mean, for example, it, I, you know, I try to be as, as kind as I can, but I, as a writer and a speaker, I get a lot of invitations to speak. And I used to just say yes all the time, mm. just because I didn't like saying no. But what was happening there was I was spreading myself so thin I mean, really all over the place. And a lot of the events were non-paying events, so I wasn't, so I was really giving up a lot of my time and then negating, neglecting spending time at home with, with yeah. loved ones. And so eventually uh, I had to learn as self-care, as being kind to myself, I had to learn to say no. Yeah. And it was difficult at first because it went against my, my natural instinct and also what I convinced myself about the need to be kind to others. And what got me around that is recognizing that uh, I need to also be kind to myself or there will come a point where that will start to become stressful and therefore I won't, the, won't, the energy yeah. of kindness won't actually be infusing the things that I'll be, I'll be doing. So, so for me, that is something I've had to learn and it's part of what self-care is. It's not necessarily taking a spa day, but one of the things that, one of the ways that I do that now is I, if someone needs my time, usually I can find a, a slot in my diary so now what I do is I put a slot in my diary saying meeting with self. <laughs> and I give that as much priority as the priority I would give to some, something that was really important. So and, what I'm, and what I'm saying is this meeting with myself, which is my time to do anything I want, is so important to me. I'm giving it an absolute priority by putting a two hour or a one hour slot in my diary. So I do that. Uh, and that's part of self-care for me. But because it, Time is a big commodity for me. I find myself so busy a lot of the time. That is a great act of self-care because I'm giving myself the time. Yeah. So, so it's difficult really to, to separate being kind to others and being kind to yourself because you really have to do both. Yeah, absolutely. You have yeah. To do both. Great idea. Um, David, we could talk forever and I really do appreciate you saying yes to this. I, it really, really means a lot to me. So thank you. Um, that was a definite act of kindness and, and you've made us both feel good, I hope. <laughs> I really appreciate it. I always love, I always love chatting with you, Judy. <laughs> good. Um, so the, you've, got, you've got lots of books, as we've discussed, and you've got lots going on. So tell us where people can uh, find more about your work and, um, and just remind us of the title of the new book and, um, and then we'll look forward to, to getting hold of that right well the new book is called the little book of kindness and it's my first fully illustrated book so it's like uh, you know there's little every oh, page lovely. every so page a, a lovely kind of dip dip inable book fantastic yeah, dip, yeah yeah it's for dippers and stuff it's a really <laughs> cool excellent and it basically covers all the scientific uh, benefits all the physiological and health emotional, mental, emotional health sure. benefits of being kind, but all nicely fancy illustrated with, with exercises and practices to do for self-care, but also to demonstrate the effects. And so, so all the info on that and myself is on my website, drdavidhamilton.com. And I'm not sure when this, when this is going live, but at the moment, for anyone who pre-orders the book, they get a free online course on the biology and contagiousness of kindness, which is one of my brand new online course, and that's free for lessons. So anyone who book comes out on the 7th of February, so anyone who pre-orders before then gets that course. You just, the link to do that is on my, on my website. Excellent. David, thank you so much. We really appreciate it and uh, look forward to seeing you um, some point in the future. Appreciate my it. Pleasure. Thank you. I look forward to that too, Jeannie. Cheers.